not filmmaking nor a fashion show, but the return of Chinese traditional clothing to the streets. Nowadays, an increasing number of people, mainly the young, are wearing Han Chinese clothing in their daily life. Among the countless suits and jeans, it is so fresh to see Chinese original clothing shuffling in between the charcoal gray and denim blue. What has brought Chinese clothing back to us? What are the cultural or mental symbols behind the resurgence? And how shall we look at the dress code in China? Sitting with me today are Han Hua, research fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at the Renmin University, and Harvey Zodin, senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. First of all, Han Hua and Harvey, uh, let's have a brief mm -hmm. uh, account or briefing on Han Chinese clothing. What's the definition? Okay, uh, Yang Rui, first thing first, I would say it's uh, so good to have a break from your serious dialogue <laughs> and talk She's about something. <laughs> <laughs> this no, is I'm serious. not. Serious. <laughs> I'm serious in, you know, in saying that I'm happy to talk about this topic instead of something serious. To have fun about life. And to also talk about some long-term impact when China is engaging into the dialogue with the world using its traditional Han clothing and the associated Han clothing culture with that. And the Han, you know, Han clothing is ever evolving. This is, you know, my understanding and observation of the Han clothing. It is not just the clothing for the Han dynasty. It is not either the Han clothing for the Han people only. It is kind of a evolving clothing and dress code for the Asian Chinese all the way from the Huang Emperor, Emperor Huang's period to the beginning of the Qing dynasty. So Han clothing itself is evolving all the way through and the people wearing Han clothing have, have gone through so many different dynasties and they have to accommodate to that with their understanding of the culture. Harvey, uh, many experts and international observers who follow the economic expansion of China might be caught a little bit unprepared by the resurgence in the Han Chinese clothing. What's your understanding about the cultural elements behind this fashion, if we could call it a fashion of Han Chinese clothing? I think that China is a very powerful country now and is also, uh, while uh, being a uh, powerful country, it also was a powerful country. And wearing uh, the Han Fu, the Han clothing, is a reaffirmation of the power that was China. It's actually a reaffirmation of the Chinese dream to have a, a strong uh, country again as China was for so many thousands of years in the past. So while there's no real definition of what uh, the uh, Hanfu clothing is because it went through so many metamorphoses, um, the major point here is that it represents a resurgence in China's culture and bridges Chinese culture from a long, long time ago to today. And I believe that it's no different than uh, you say in, the, in Japan where people wear a kimono or people in Korea wear the traditional Chinese dress. It's just another expression, but it's a lot more than that. It's Chinese soft power. It's an expression. It's also saying where Chinese young people are today in terms of their hopes and dreams. It is indeed an expression and a message sent by the younger generation about their understanding mm. on the past. However, don't you think public perceptions have more or less been shaped by the media coverage, such as a, a television drama about the ancient power struggles in the dynasties uh, of uh, the feudal times uh, uh, in Chinese Gong Dou Xi, so <laughs> Han Fu yes. may have del delivered a strong impact on public perceptions about how we look uh, uh, how we looked uh, in the remote past. Yes, these cultural products, these modern or uh, popular po cultural products like TV dramas or films or even the internet, you know, the, uh, the internet literature books 
all convey the, the, the messages to the young people when young people are regarded as the, the, the born natural net netizens. So they will definitely look through. Maybe in the past, people as individuals, they grew this interest towards the traditional Chinese clothing, not only Han, maybe Qi Pao as well. And they cannot be connected with people like them, but now thanks to the internet and maybe thanks to the other popular culture products, they can be kind of interconnected and that they can share the information, share their aspirations towards the new evolution of this traditional Chinese clothing. And that will bring them to a bigger circle and then bring them also not online but offline to do you know, a lot of Han Fu show or other offline activities to bring the people with same, you know, same hobbies, same interests together more, more closer. Here is a controversial issue, Harvey. When we look at the issue of uh, evolution of the society, you have uh, entirely different perspectives in different directions. For example, you may look back uh, to see the renaissance of a great nation, as you said wisely at the very beginning of our discussion. The other very different perspective might be, hey, China should be further integrated with the rest of the world by wearing Western suits like the way we look? Mm. Well, I think integration is a mm. two-way process. And I believe that because the world is still globalized, uh, we should uh, go global. And that means that uh, China needs to study what goes on outside of its borders. But um, the people outside of its borders have to also study uh, China as well. So I think that there's a kind of interbreeding here going on in terms of the clothing. But we're not just talking about clothing. We're talking about how the world has been and how it's changing. The clothing are expressions of people and their desires. And I, I find it very interesting. I, I find it actually to be a principal contradiction, mm -hmm. if you want to talk about it in Marxian terms, that an Asian society, which is supposed to represent the group as opposed to individuals, now has many individuals uh, dressing individually, but in a very um, old style that was popular, but putting their own touches on it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very beautiful place to be. Speaking of this personal touch, just let me contribute to an, uh, you another story about you know, China's contribution to the world by adapting the Chinese, uh, the culture uh, symbols or Chinese characteristics of traditional clothing. We have the designer, Madame Chu Yan, who actually is the chief designer of the 2014 Beijing APAC. And she designed this modernized, or we call the new Han and the Tang style dress and provide it to the world so I can agree more it's a two-way street we are trying the effort to, to let people know the characteristics of the traditional culture and how we are able to modernize it to accommodate to the new days technology new day societal development as well as others and, and I think back to the first time I was in China as a tourist in 1988 it could have been 1688. It was, it was mm -hmm. so um, undeveloped at that time. And everybody wore the same, we call them Mao suits, the same mm -hmm. gray or blue uh, clothing. There was no differentiation between people, between sexes, at least that I could see. And as an old TV uh, cigarette advertising says in America, you've come a long way, baby, mm. really such a long way. Because now you have people using your own culture, expressing uh, its beauty, but in a, in a modern and in an individual way. I think it shocks people, actually, on the outside to see this degree of individualization with some of the bad rap that China is still getting. Mm. Today, uh, Harvey and uh, Han Hua, we are just using the topic of Han Chinese clothing to start our discussion, a serious one about our awareness about the dress code. Yeah. It seems uh, four decades after the opening up and perhaps since the uh, founding of the First Republic in 1911 by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, uh, we were quite divided and quite confused as to what kind of a dress code we should employ. Uh, on some uh, important occasions, particularly diplomatic ones, uh, people tend to wear Western suits. On some other um, occasions about fashion mm. uh, or 
seminars, official meetings, one should give the invitation uh, card with a demand about the dress code. But in most cases, including the PR companies, they fail to let the people know the dress code. Mm. So have you noticed this kind of a very loose standard mm -hmm. and this may have undermined the image of China? Uh, I, my positive attitude towards that is uh, Chinese people are evolving and 10 years ago maybe people don't really care about this dress code thing and uh, from my past career experiences I was in the media content and then the media business field and we took uh, care of the dress code very seriously I remember one time my boss told me that I'd, over, I'd rather overdressed than underdressed mm -hmm. which is very crucial to me you know towards the attitude of the dress code but uh, you know Chinese people is going through a, a development is this still a process but speaking of the Han closing culture I would like to mention that point out that actually there was a very serious dress code for the Han closing during even during the different dynasties we have the dress for the formal court dress and we have the dress for the you know the other business activities we have the dress when we are at home these are so different and this can also be very individualized by tailor-made you know attaching the personal characteristics this is the beauty all the secret of the Han closing back then we are not uh, uh, learning from the Western societies regarding the dress code what we just need to do is to picking up you know the the critical elements of the hand closing and the still you know get involved into the modern days daily dress so it's kind of a combination or renaissance it's not you know we're just learning refresh or learning fresh from the western society here is yet another serious concern Harvey I wonder if you have done any serious Chinese studies about our history in particular did you notice that the Chinese uh, somehow lament the loss of their Han traditional culture due to the intrusion and the invasion of overseas culture like um, uh, nomadic cultures of the Mongolians? I think you can see the fact that Han clothing is coming back in many shapes and forms as a uh, reversion uh, to the prior uh, society and I think that that's a good thing because it represents a long sweep of Chinese history and Chinese accomplishments it's nothing to take away uh, from uh, the uh, clothing that uh, became uh, prevalent in the Qing dynasty but I'd say the Hanfu uh, is the original and long time uh, clothing style but the beauty of it is that now with uh, the internet and so many research tools uh, we can get to the bottom of the beauty we can add our own beauty we can also um, add beauty that may not conform precisely with ancient uh, doctrines but also which give people a high degree of self-expression I think that's really wonderful Thank you so much. You're watching Dialogue with Han Hua and Harvey Zodin. We're discussing why we have this return of the Han Chinese closing and what's behind the pursuit of a cultural identity. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Han Hua. With the end of the Cold War, it seems mm. uh, some of the big powers like Russia and China start their search for national identity. Uh, which was covered up by ideology during the Cold War. But with the disintegration of the former Soviet Union, Russian people start to re-examine their national identity because they are some, somehow uh, tied up in between Europe and Asia. Mm. Uh, they have been conquered by Mongolians for two centuries and a half. They've been conquered by um, Christian cultures, mm. so on and so forth. But the Russians have never been made sure about who they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Somehow, as I said earlier, before mm -hmm. we took the break, uh, following the invasion by Mongolians and Manchurians, we also faced the embarrassing loss of our own original cultural identity. Uh, somehow that has eroded our awareness about national identity. Mm -hmm. So we made the fourth movement, which uh, somehow led to radical departure from traditional Chinese culture. Uh, and then during the Cultural Revolution, we did much of the same mistakes, uh, not to respect our traditional culture. Today, we see the return 
of Han Chinese clothing mm -hmm. return much stronger than we have expected, although mm -hmm. uh, we see some elements of individuality due yes. to the in, uh, impact of the Internet. So mm -hmm. what do you think of this kind of a general trend by mm -hmm. Russia and China to search for their national identity with the end of the Cold War? You pointed and described it so well about you know these countries, not only Russia and China, maybe some other countries in this geopolitical change, the environment change, the context changed of the external environment as well as the domestic environment, and the, even the land change. You know, we we have the land, we lost the land, for 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 big countries like China or Russia. So during the process, it's, to me, it's like from going from one extreme when they suffered, not only the nation, but the people suffered, and then going to the other extreme, like you said, the, the, the culture revolution, also the May 4th uh, movement departure from the Chinese traditional culture. So nowadays I think with the growth of economic development and the, the power the soft power the hot power you know growing and uh, I think people are getting back to the essence of Chinese culture for China per se I'm not talking about Russia I'm not a Russian expert but for China per se I think the essence of Chinese traditional culture one point one key is to be kind of neutral uh, we want to reach the harmony, you know, between people, between nature and the people, and the between among the countries as well. So this kind of revisit of the Chinese traditional culture, or kind of revision of this, uh, the culture extremes, might be, you know, Hanfu is might be a, a fact or reality to these days towards the young people. Or young people are using this kind of style or tailor-made with traditional uh, style, with traditional culture attached, using this kind of, you know, a, 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 t a try as a main to revit, revisit the essence of our traditional culture. I'm pretty convinced that people like Harvard uh, experts who have lived in China for a number of years may have developed a benevolent understanding about your cultural awareness on mm -hmm. national identity. However, mm -hmm. people such as Madam Skinner in mm -hmm. the State Department <laughs> may describe the rise of China as the first clash between a Caucasian cultures and non Caucasian civilization. That is ridiculous. And therefore, the return of the Han Chinese mm -hmm. clothing may be described as a kind of a, a, a racial mm -hmm. uh, clashes. And the return of China, the rise of Chinese culture, may be viewed as pretty scary. And the Chinese dream uh, might be a nightmare for <laughs> those who follow the expansion of Chinese influence, such as, uh, say, the Confucius Institute mm -hmm. in uh, Europe. Uh, sorry, in the United States in particular, suffered more setbacks and caused more misunderstanding, if not hostile perceptions from locals than in Europe, uh, than in Africa. So what do you think of this kind of uh, alleged clashes between civilizations? Uh, are we going to have this return of uh, what Professor Sammy Huntington calls uh, a nightmare uh, between Western civilizations and uh, Confucianism? I think we're actually going to have a cross-pollination of cultures because we live in a globalized world and we live in an internet world and we live in an electronic interconnected mm. world and I think it's completely wrong for uh, people like uh, Madam Skinner or Vice President Mike Pence to paint China as a country of uh, automatons uh, who are living uh, without uh, hope and living uh, without individuality uh, and without a good standard of living because it's, that's just not true. That I believe that um, the adoption and reinvention, if you will, of the Han clothing and the individuality that it brings at the same time that it's a reaffirmation of history shows that Chinese people have a very high standard of living, that they're very individual, uh, that they have choices about mm. their uh, clothing and they're expressing uh, their choices in ways not possible uh, 30 or 40 years ago. So I don't think there's going to be a clash of culture. Mm. I think there'll be a melding of culture. And I think part of it will come when uh, China is able to tell its story better through Hollywood and other means. China is trying, and I think slowly, slowly the message is getting out. Mm -hmm.
What do you think of uh, uh, the cultural differences that we see in South Asia? Prime Minister Modi is always wearing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something which is very attractive mm -hmm. for, uh, for the look, not for the ideas that he presents. I sometimes wonder if that's uh, clothing as soft power or clothing as a weapon. <laughs> because, no, seriously. Yes. Because uh, in the case of, of India, it's quite a divided country now uh, because of uh, the clash. Of, they have within one country a clash mm. of several civilizations that they haven't fully uh, resolved. And I think in his case, it's uh, both a soft power uh, and a hard power weapon. But I think it's very good generally for leaders to promote their own culture and to do it in part through clothing because it represents eons really of experience, of cultural experience in a culture. And if everybody uh, looks same old, same old, even mm. if it's beautiful colors of APEC, now, it's not as good as a, a rainbow of different colors, different ideas, different cultures uh, that have been created on our earth. Persians in Iran also pursue their very, very unique dress code. Mm. Um, let's look at Japan, yeah. where since the Meiji Restoration, uh, the economic success, and of course the military failures, uh, in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not talking about the geopolitical ambition of uh, what was uh, a empire before being defeated by the Americans towards the end of the Second World War. Japan is a country where people are able to combine traditional culture with uh, not only modernity, but in, in many ways um, uh, aspects of modern and Western lifestyle. So why do you think Japanese are so different from China, from which they inherited a lot of elements of traditional culture, particularly during the Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, they surprised the rest of the world with their amazing ability to combine traditional elements with modern lifestyle. Yeah, mm. on this regard, actually, I really uh, appreciate the Japanese, the, their capability in you know, trying or their efforts in trying to maintain their their ways of honoring the traditional culture. For example, the natural materials used for the clothing, as well as a you know a traditional lifestyles. As to why, I think it's also because the mention in, in your mentioning about the different turbulences uh, Japan has been going through, especially in the modern days. In the past decades, they have been going through so many turbulences actually within such short period of time. So for them to honor something and to maintain something for the core of their culture, even the core culture may be some, you know, learned from the Tang Dynasty and as well as their architecture style. So I, I think it's it's their kind of you know secret weapon as you mentioned earlier, you know, to use you know, these external elements, the factors to express that they are holding of the core elements of their, uh, supposed to their own culture. You don't expect people to be always formally dressed up, but on occasions such as a wedding and a funeral, um, people are required uh, to follow a certain uh, dress code. Now, having said this, uh, Harvey, what do you think of the Japanese way of accepting a Western culture following the Meiji Restoration, not only their pursuit of a military technology for shipbuilding that helped Japan defeat our naval fleet during the, uh, in the mid-19th century, uh, but also uh, their respect for the universal values uh, which somehow were imposed by the Americans in 1945 for example, the pacifist constitution. And the Japanese are, are also able to institutionalize some of the things that they hold so dear. In, in our country, we have a pretty loose perception, pretty loose uh, control, pretty loose governance uh, about uh, what we like. In Japan, everything is uh, well-disciplined, uh, well-institutionalized, it seems. I was in Japan earlier 
uh, in mm -hmm. the week in Osaka. I hadn't been in Japan for quite a few years, and I was uh, struck by its cleanliness and by its orderliness and by, in some ways, the sameness of the people. I think a lot of it uh, goes to the core histories of the two mm. countries. Japan was a closed off society by and large for centuries. China was a trading society uh, with um, pioneers like Admiral Zheng He in the Ming Dynasty going uh, to many, many other places in the world uh, conducting tremendous voyages with a with what was then high tech, but by today's standard, not so at all. So I think the difference is mm -hmm. that Japan is a closed society um, that is doing the best it can to uh, meld itself uh, under its circumstances with modern society as dictated by America and others. Um, whereas China has had centuries and centuries of exposure and interaction with the outside world. So I think that gives China a lot more flexibility mm -hmm. and I think it also is uh, a hopeful sign for China's future to have that flexibility. I agree. Ch China is such a, a, to add on that, the populations are so different that the geopolitical uh, understanding and the conditions are so different. So that may be another reason for the differences of honoring the traditional culture is different. Uh, we have our own ways of honoring you know our traditional culture while Japanese given you know the reasons in the history given the reasons of its geopolitical con condition so they have their own ways. Uh, the last question is very much about the importance of having our own mm -hmm. national dress. Uh, should we go back to the Maoist jacket, Zhong Shanzhuang? Should we go back to the Han Chinese clothing? Uh, or do you think, uh, come on, just have fun. Don't be so serious about uh, uh, a universal uh, standard, uh, a standardized uh, dress code. Just respect individuality in their choice of the dress and how they look. Mm -hmm. To me, this is really a case of <laughs> we should let a hundred flowers bloom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I believe that people should have fun and should have individuality. And uh, I don't think that Hanfu should be the national dress because the 55 other ethnic groups also have their beautiful dresses and China is a nation of 56 flowers. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just well said, think, well yeah, said. Yeah, th 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 there should be any, I mean, the governance, you know, from, the, um, from on top to have, have their say over what we should wear. You know, it's already very colorful. We have passed such a long way to be colorful again, so let's keep it. In lawmaking bodies in the West, you see lawmakers, uh, members of parliament are very serious about their representation checks and balances. In our great hall of the people during the Liang Hui sessions, you see the colorful representation of individual cultures, right? Men and women wearing their ethnic uh, yeah. dress to somehow showcase uh, our respect for cultural diversity. Thank you so much for being with us in this edition of Dialogue on why the return of Han Chinese clothing. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>